Hey, everybody. Sorry for the silence there. We had a couple of issues with login information this morning. It's always fun to do something live. Thanks for joining us. This is Jimmy Beach. Welcome to our exposure webinar today. We're going to go through some foundations on using exposure. So we'll go through the entire process of editing. Uh, by the end, we'll have a clear understanding of how exposure operates. So feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. If they're not addressed during the presentation, we will get them at the end during our Q&A period. So if, uh, if you do ask a question and it seems like I'm ignoring you, I'm doing that on purpose. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm actually doing that just because I will answer that in detail at the end. So stay tuned for that stuff if you do have some specific questions. So let's, uh, let's get started today. I'm going to give you a couple of tidbits about historic information about exposure, and then we're going to get into using the software. So uh, history, um, over 16 years ago now, exposure was created for film photographers. Um, the transition between working with analog film in the darkroom to using just digital cameras uh, didn't really satisfy the needs of film photographers. So um, they wanted the feel and the look of the films that they used to use in uh, the time that they spent in the dark room with enlargers and all that stuff. So exposures, accurate film emulation presets were really what bridged that gap for them. So that's really where it all began. Excuse me. So I do believe that I already pointed out that we're going to have time for answering questions at the end. And also, we are monitoring that chat. So if you have any technical questions, uh, Nate is right there to answer those because he is hashtag awesome. Okay, without further ado, let's look at how we can make or how exposure helps make organizing hassle free. So when we begin processing images and hit tab, uh, when we begin processing our images, typically what we do is we copy them to the computer first. And so I'm going to switch over to the culling uh, workspace here. And so when we go to copy our images from a card, we will typically grab, uh, it will automatically open to the following dialogue, this one. Now, it'll automatically open here when you insert a camera card into the computer that you haven't before, that's new. So it'll come up like this. Okay, so here's my camera card right here. I clicked on it. Let's look at these numbers across the top of this panel. Uh, step one, the numbered section. Step one is where the source, the selected source. So that would be our camera card that we just plugged into the computer. Uh, step two would be to review the images here where you select which one of the images or which ones of the images you want to copy. Uh, you can just select all of them or whatever down here at the bottom too. You can also change the size of the thumbnails with this slider if you choose to. So I have them all selected. And then step three is to where you set where you want the images to be saved. So in here, this is our destination information. If I twist this down or mm -hmm, expand is what that says. So anyway, I am saving it. I can do it to a standard location like my desktop. But however, I am going to save it to another folder and you can see right here on my desktop in the photos folder, that's where I wanna save these images. So that's what that says right there. And then down here, it says generate subfolders. So I'll delete this. This is what it'll look like when you start up exposure for the first time. So I'm gonna say, I wanna add a subfolder for all these images because they are from a man by the name of photographer. Whoops, not that one. Let's do that again. Custom text, a photographer by the name of John Barclay. Yes, I was typing and talking at the same time. I think that's a talent I should brag about right there. Okay, so that's a subfolder inside of this photos folder, okay? So that's just a couple of options we can have here for our destination options. Like I said, it makes it a little hassle-free, so it's nice and quick. Uh, you can rename your images as they're being copied if you choose to, and you can even save presets for how you want to name those if you have a standard um, file format or naming format that you use. You can also assign metadata to the images as you copy them over, such as copyright information and whatnot. And um, you can even apply them or uh, save them to collections or apply keywords, or you can even apply some of your favorite presets from right within exposure 
as those images are copied directly to your computer. I'm not gonna do that for the demo. I'm gonna say, okay. Now, this was a quick demonstration, right? We have about 30 files here. Oh, it, actually, yeah, we have 30 files here. It says right here at the top. So I'm gonna say, okay, I do have a fast connection. So it's gonna zip through this really fast. But the point that I wanna make when this happens is that Exposure doesn't use a catalog or modules. So you can immediately begin working on your images even while they are in the middle of being copied. Okay, so here's magic time. I'll say, okay, and there we go. We can see that dialogue right here that I'm trying to move around so it doesn't disappear. That means that they are copying right now or just about done. And now I can go to the folder where they live and I can begin editing them. And so John Barclay, that's where we saved them right there. So that was the process of ingesting our images, it went really fast, okay? So um, because Exposure is a uses a catalog free workflow, I wanna stop and talk about that before we get into actually processing our images, because that's where you know, we're gonna make edits and we're also going to apply some metadata here. Um, so what I wanna point out is it's catalog free. So what that means is I'm gonna bring up a finder window, there we go. And in the finder window, we can see this is on my desktop here. And I am in the photos folder, just like I saved those files and the John Barclay images. Now, you can see that there's a folder within, right? These are all the raw files right here that we're, we're looking at them right here in the background, okay? This is why exposure, this is the uh, not catalog approach, okay? Everything and anything that we do to these images now will be saved in sidecar files that exist right here within that folder, okay? So that makes it really handy for when you wanna do things like copy your entire, all of your edits and information and stuff to another, maybe a hard drive, right? I have a backup, let's say. I can grab a hold of that, drag the whole folder in and save it to an external hard drive, make a copy of it. And that includes all of my edits. That includes all of the metadata that I do to or use to uh, apply organizing or that I use to organize these folders or these images, sorry. And so, um, and all of that belongs within that folder. Now, that makes it really easy to do transfers and backups and things like that, and even collaborate with outside retouchers or anything like that. All right, so we have the images copied. So let's take a look at how we can call and then edit the shoot down to the top shots that we want to edit within exposure. And then we'll talk about how we can edit those photos themselves. So back inside exposure here, you'll notice that we have workspaces in exposure and I have been going through them. There are a couple of different ones that you can use and you can even make your own if you are um, doing specific things inside of exposure. So uh, culling is what we're gonna do next. That would be organizing or editing the photo shoot or um, we're just trying to find the best one so that we don't spend all of our time editing every shot if we don't necessarily need to. Okay. So we talked about how the folder structure, or, I'm sorry, we talked about how inside of Exposure, we're looking just at our hard drive. And this is with the same organization system that we use there, right? So on the desktop, we can see it right here. I have a photos folder, we can see it here. And inside of that, John Barclay's folder, simple enough. I showed you that finder window before that shows you the same organization system. What this means is that I can jump through a bunch of different files and folders very easily and quickly in Exposure, and it's all right here within the Folders panel, okay? Now, down toward the bottom of the Folders panel is a Collections that uh, I can expand, and Collections are a great way to organize images that maybe don't all live in the same place on your hard drive. So maybe some are on your uh, hard drive, some are maybe on a backup, uh, hard drive or a network storage device that you have connected or uh, Google Drive. And you have these collections that organize all of those for you. So collections are a great organizing feature too. Let's, okay, so back to our folder of images. Now let's begin to actually organize these images themselves, okay? So uh, notice that we have the metadata panel open. The metadata panel gives us a lot of information about each one of these files inside of Exposure. Okay, so it gives, it gives you metadata information such as the exposure time or the f-stop, the, the um, 
camera model use, the serial number, things like that. And you can use that information to organize your images here. For example, if you had two cameras that you went and shot the same event with, you'd want to select all of the images from, let's say, camera number so-and-so. It says it right here. And you'd want to select those because maybe your time wasn't synced between those two cameras. So you need to sync the time. Well, you'd use metadata to uh, use or to uh, select those images so that you can do things like that. So that's why metadata is open. It's important information. However, I'm going to close it because I want to see pretty pictures. That's why we're here. Okay, so we can see these images coming across the top of exposure. This is the grid view right here in the center. If we open up this other doc, then you can see there's a kind of a center area. That is the preview area. So we're looking at all of the images in a grid. If I double click, it goes to single view. And then down here at the bottom, actually, let me bring this up a little bit. Yeah, and then down here at the bottom, then you can see the other images there in thumbnails along the, along the bottom. So we can click to navigate through them just like so. We can also use the arrow keys, which speed us up quite a bit. So let's begin employing, employing buttons on the keyboard. Uh, keyboard shortcuts are a great way to go really fast when you're doing things in exposure. And when let's say you have a thousand images that you want to jump through real quick and edit them quickly or get through them at least before your eyes bug out of your head, or, you know, you want to go to sleep for the night, uh, you want to use keyboard shortcuts to speed you up. So before I start listing them off though, don't feel like you need to memorize everything that I say inside of exposure in the help menu, we can see that there's a list for the keyboard shortcuts. So you can always go right there to see what the keyboard shortcuts are to get through whatever processes you're running or editing with or doing inside of Exposure. There's also a link to the manual, which has a full written description of all of the things, all of the buttons and tiddlywinks, I would say, uh, about Exposure that you can access here. And there's also a link to tutorials. So you can always watch uh, videos that explain how to use or do different processes within Exposure. So I just wanted to point that out. So don't feel overwhelmed. So we can, we can access our keyboard shortcuts very easily. Speaking of keyboard shortcuts, down here at the bottom, we have the filter um, menu. We can see it, okay? So it has a flag as pick right here. That's the white. That's flag as reject, and that's no flag. These three right here operate together. Those are our flags. So let's apply some flags to these images. Here, I'll raise this up so we can see bigger thumbnails, okay? So let's apply some flags to these images and then we can see what that actually does and use uh, our, why we would use this for organizing. So in this first image here, you can see at the bottom, there's a flag icon. I can click that. It turns white and now that is flag as a pick. So let's do it quicker with the arrow or with the uh, keyboard shortcuts. So I'm not gonna use the keyboard this time. I'm gonna use the arrow button on the keyboard and then I'll hit plus. So now that one is flag is pick. So if I want to reject, I want to reject, then minus is the button that I want. And if I accidentally apply either a reject or a pick flag and I want to undo that, I just apply the same thing again and then it goes away. See, it says remove flag. So all well and good, I can use the keyboard to get through the images and I can apply the uh, appropriate flag for my liking or whatever the demo is that I'm going to uh, make happen, okay? So as I'm, I'm just going through here and I'm using the arrow keys and I'm using the plus and minus buttons on the keyboard. Now, I'm gonna hit escape to go back to the grid view where we can see all of these images in a grid. And some of them are dark that I make, I've marked as a reject flag and some of them are uh, have a white outline and those are pick. So let's now think about applying our filter, which is going to help us to organize our photos, right? Let's say we just want to see the ones that are for pick, that I uh, apply to pick flag. So there we go. So now from 30 total images, you can see here on the bottom, we have 17 that we marked with a pick flag. So we're starting to narrow down our batch really quickly. That's what we did with our flags. So exposure can use the same or the same principle applies to adding uh, ratings to your images, like uh, stars one through five, 
and uh, color labels as well. So here they are, red, yellow, green, blue, and purple, and that's no, uh, no color. Okay, so we can do the same thing that we did with the flags as we can with the star ratings and the color labels. This time, I'm not gonna use the uh, arrow. Well, actually, let me show you where you can do that with the uh, mouse, and then I'll use the keyboard. So they're at the bottom here of each one of your images in your thumbnail view, and we can apply whatever star rating we'd like to to the image, and then it sits right there at the bottom, you can see. When it doesn't have a rating, that means you haven't rated it yet. So I can click between them like this and apply ratings however I'd like, or make it quicker with the keyboard, we can apply the same thing here. Now, when we apply the uh, ratings, you can see that you can go pretty quick when you're doing it just like this. When you apply the ratings or pick flags or color labels, you can hold down the shift button, which is a which will um, automatically progress to the next image after you assign whatever it is that you are to this image. So I'm gonna hold down shift and push four. Now you can see that it jumped to the next image. Okay, now, and that one was rated a four. So that makes it even quicker to get through here. Okay, so this time, now we've gone through here and we have our ratings, okay? So now let's use another filter here at the bottom of the screen. And we'll just look at the really good ones, three and up, okay? So oh, that's not enough, let's say four and up. Okay, so now we're down to 13 instead of 17. Lost four on that count. This time, let's go through one more time and quickly apply some color labels, which will help us sort these even a little bit more. Uh, color labels can be really used for anything. They can be identifying images for, uh, I used to use them when I would do edit weddings and red would be that I hadn't touched it. Yellow would be that I wanted it to be black and white. Green was that I processed it, um, but I hadn't applied the effect and blue was done. So everybody uses them differently is kind of what I'm going for here. And so this time we're gonna use the button or the keyboard shortcut for red six, yellow seven, eight for green, nine for blue and there's not a 10 button, so that one's not gonna work. So anyway, that's what we can do is those buttons here. I'm gonna hold down, or these, col these colors here, excuse me. I'm gonna hold down the shift button when I do this, or the shift key, and you'll see how I progress through these images pretty quickly. I'm gonna make them a little bit smaller so you can see me jump between them and it's not such a stark change. Okay, so here we go. I'm clicking on the first one, hold on shift, and we can apply however we want to. Now, the reason that I went through that quickly is to show you that you really can move really quickly, okay? When you're doing things here inside of Exposure. And now that we have our color labels applied, we can further neck down our filter so that we're only seeing the ones we have red labeled that say, let's say we make the, those ones color process. And then the yellow ones, we say, we wanna do some edits to those and then green ones, oops, let's turn those off, just green these ones are gonna be black and white. That's kind of the thing that we can do with these different color labels to quickly go through and sort and call our images down to just the top selects. So that way we're not editing every single photo or you know, spending some extra time editing every single photo, especially ones that we're not planning to keep or use. So that was a bunch of quick stuff right there to go through organizing and exposure, but that is a very uh, important part of the workflow, and that's kind of where it begins. So we've, uh, we've wrapped up the organizing part of it. So I'm gonna hit escape. Oop, yeah, I'm gonna hit escape. Let's turn off our filters. So to do that, I'm gonna hit command O. So now my filters have been undone. So now I see all of the images in this folder again. Okay, so we're gonna talk about raw processing, actually get in, getting into the editing portion of the workflow now. So the first stop is raw processing, okay? So let's, um, let me find a good image here to talk about raw processing with. This one's good. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm gonna go to another workspace now that I'm not doing calling, I'm doing editing. Okay, so I don't need to see the thumbnails at the bottom anymore. I can close that uh, dock there. I'm gonna leave the dock here open on the right, and then I'll close all of these panels up so that I can see them all labeled here. Okay, I don't need this one, so I'll, I'll 
hide this one at the top too. And yes, I am showing you how to um, move and manipulate all of the UI and uh, exposure so that it works for your workflow. Now, now that I've kind of went through and changed all of that stuff, I wanted to point out that the workspaces, see I'm in the editing workspace. I just changed that preference, right? So if I go to the calling workspace, this is what I was doing. Let me go back to the editing workspace. Oop, let's go back to the editing workspace. Oh, it just looks like how I, did, how I fixed it. So what I did was I, I manipulated this so that I had the panels that I wanted to open and close, and I sized them to however wanted, I wanted them to be. And it saved it to that profile or to that workspace. So uh, workspaces are very dynamic. You can do a lot of things with them. I wanted to point that out before we start getting into editing. So, uh, so yeah, you can make as many workspaces as you like. It's really easy to do. And, uh, and you can arrange uh, the panels to be however you want them to be and in what, whatever order you want them to be in. So we have a video specific about just doing that, uh, manipulating workspaces and such on our website. So check that one out if, you, um, if you're interested. Okay, so we don't need the folders panel. We know that we're inside of this John Barclay folder. So um, the first thing that we're gonna talk about when we're editing photos is what kind of edits we're applying, okay? And what I mean is there are kind of two ways that you can think about applying edits to images. Typically would be uh, you could use them to correct any issues in a photo, like it's a little bit blurry or uh, the perspective's not quite right or it's a little bit dark, whatever. Or edits can be applied creatively or for a creative effect to make it look prettier or warmer or more inviting or whatever. So the first things that we're gonna talk about are the ones that we would use to correct any technical issues, let's say, or any issues, any problems that we wanna address when we're editing, okay? So I'm gonna close the left panel over here and I'm gonna open up lens correction. This is kind of the first stop. Lens correction is something that um, exposure does automatically or manually. So this, uh, the shot here was shot using um, a, uh, what was it? This XF model lens from Fuji. Uh, so it's automatically applied, but we, if we wanted to, we can actually make that, um, we can use manual if we want to control like distortion or vignetting or anything like that for lens correction, because we have a specific look in mind. Okay. Some people, when you shoot with a specific lens and specific camera, you have a look in mind or because of the lights that you use or something, you want it to be very dialed in tight. So then you can have your manual controls to uh, make it behave how you would like to or go with the profile for automatic. Now, that's something that's possible here in exposure. And that would really be one of the first stops that I would say is that if you want to use lens correction or if you don't want to use lens correction, you can do that with lens correction. That's the first step. Next one would be sharpening. That would be the second step. So sharpening, let's go to the sharpening panel. And whenever you're doing sharpening, it's a great idea to zoom in to at least a one-to-one, -one, which is so that your pixels aren't being skewed or stretched. You want to see it at the resolution that it's shot. So that's just to identify if you see sharpening artifacts. Another thing to look for is a nice hard edge between light and dark, like this with contrast on it. And you also want to see some areas of dark. And if you can, some areas of very light. Okay, so that's a great place to look when you're applying sharpening effects. How, how did I zoom in? Uh, I double clicked to go to one to one, you just click actually just one click. Uh, if you want to zoom in even further, you can over on the panel here. See, we're at one to one view. We can scroll our mouse to zoom in. And we can also hit uh, command minus and command plus or if you're on Windows control. Anyway, back to where we were. Let's go to one-to-one -one view so that we're not stretching any pixels or anything. Okay, so now applying sharpening. So it's pretty simple and straightforward. We're gonna apply some of the amount, which is how much of the effect, and then you dial in all of the other uh, sliders below it. Now. A good rule of thumb when you're doing editing or processing an exposure is that you start at the top of the panel, in this case, the sharpening panel, and you work your way down, okay? Now, 
Sharpening in particular, I like to turn way up high like it is right here, so it's way too strong. And then I can dial in the rest of the look with these other sliders, make it look just right, and then I will dial the amount back down just so that that way I know that the sharpening is right for the image and that it's not too strong. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, again, there's a keyboard shortcut I'm gonna mention, and that's the Alt key or Option key. Now I'm gonna hold that down as I make adjustments to these sliders, and you will see that the display changes. So as I drag the radius up stronger, you can see that it selects those, or you can see how wide that effect will travel in terms of from the edge that it's sharpening. Okay, so I don't want all that much because I know that's going to show sharpening artifacts. So I'm going to dial it in pretty close so that I see very sharp razor edges. And that's it. Okay, and I'm still holding alt down. I'm going to add detail. And detail at high amounts will look like it will almost sharpen um, grain or noise. So it can almost add a filmic type, type look which uh, isn't always a good thing to do on portraits. So just keep that in mind. I'm gonna keep that kind of in the middle. And then masking, holding down Alt again. This is telling me which edges, if you look in the image, the brighter the image or the brighter the edge, that is what we're actually applying the sharpening to. So I'm gonna take that down just so that I'm sharpening just the edges of these pieces and the end and, uh, of those, um, what are those buoys? Bam, just like that. Now we still have the amount really high, but it looks so much better than it did before. So I'm going to turn that back down the amount. And that is that. So that's how we apply some sharpening, a little sharpening lesson for you. That's another thing that I would do to, uh, to fix any issues inside of the image would be sharpening. Noise reduction would be another one right after sharpening. And you can see inside of the noise reduction wind or uh, panel that we are using a profile generated for the camera. Okay, so these profiles make sharpening or noise reduction very accurate inside of exposure. They're really, really cool. So they're based on a lot of information that's inside of the um, camera itself, like the uh, type of um, sensor that it uses and the uh, size of it and all that kind of stuff. And some algorithm about noise that is really smart and techy and a I don't really know, but the it, programmers know what it is and they're smart. Anyway, noise reduction is another good thing that you should apply there when you're thinking about making corrections, okay? So there's one more thing that I'm going to talk about and that's the transform tools. And the transform tools are in the crop and rotate section or crop and transform section or panel inside of exposure. So I open that up and we can see that we have uh, adjustments here to make some key stoning changes, which is, happens when a building looks like it's leaning toward you or away from you because of perspective of the lens. Uh, horizontal, it does the same thing if you're inked down a long um, straight, uh, uh, a long straight um, building or, or leading line or something like that can happen. And you can also stretch depending on what happens with perspective correction and such. So all of these kind of adjustments you can make. Same thing with rotate. You can even, um, let's, let's get this big again here. Reset it. You can even uh, draw a straight line with this, this tool right here to make it automatically say, yes, that's perfectly straight. See, I thought it was straight before, but now it's even straighter. Ah, and then we can see that if we want to center this thing right in the middle, let's make another adjustment. I'm going to be extra special here and change this to an alignment grid because I want it to be actually, no, that's too, that's not going to work. Oh, come on. This one. I want it to be there. What I'm trying to do is line this one up here in the center, this point. And so I will use the offsets, which will allow me to um, actually, wait a minute, I'm gonna stretch it a little bit. And then offset it, I have to make it smaller. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, oh, there we go, okay. Now we got it all set up the way that we want to, have it all squared up. This is another one of our make sure to fix the adjustments in the image thing. Uh, 
And now we have it set the way that we want. So I'll close that. Shazam. Now we have an image that we have some, we've made some adjustments to to fix issues with, and we're ready to start doing some creative stuff to it. So creative stuff's where the fun stuff, where, where the fun happens. So the first place I'm going to talk, or first place I'll go is the presets panel over here on the left. Remember I mentioned that exposure was uh, began with a library of presets that were offered to help uh, photographers, you know, come over from film to digital, um, digital processing. So these, a lot of the looks here, we'll go to all of them are listed here in category by type. Uh, a lot of these are actually made to emulate film stocks. Lots of them, favorite film stocks of people that used to shoot with film. I used to shoot with film when I was in college. And so this was one of my favorites right here. And, um, like I said, I was in college, so I always uh, underexposed everything like mad. So I probably ended up with shots that really look like this. <laughs> but it really does remind me of when I shot with film, and it's a lot of fun. Now, all we do is just select these different presets, and we can apply that look to the image just with one click. And there's a ton of them. So these are black and white, but we also have a bunch of colors. So let's look at color films. And then here's one for print. So color films, print, these are good options for things like portraits or things where you want more of a gentle color, something where it's not an oversaturated look like uh, maybe a green forest or something. Let's say if we're going to do something outside instead of print or low contrast, which is even better for portraits, right? You can see how a nice low contrast look that wouldn't, uh, that's, why don't we look at a portrait? There we go. We can see that a nice low contrast look on the skin here versus something that has a lot more contrast is a lot nicer to the skin. There's a light one and then one with too much color and contrast. So that's just a quick and uh, a nice demonstration here. So let's say this is Fuji Velvia. That's a really good option for landscapes. So not necessarily portraits. Let's take a look at a landscape and then try where our Fuji Velvia went. There, that looks great. So I'm just gonna hold down the backslash key, which is just above return and below delete. That's the before and that's the after, okay? Now, it's just a little bit of a tweak, punched up the contrast a little bit, makes the blues a little bit more rich. That brings out the greens in the image. Doesn't Velvia doesn't really mess with the reds all that much, but this is just a beautiful look and it also applies some sharpening, all that stuff. And it's a one click thing. So like I said, this is where exposure really got its start was all of these amazing looking presets. And so, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you are limited by your creativity here. And all you can do is apply a preset. Let me open up this other doc here and let's look at the layers. Excuse me. So I'm gonna zoom back out with my mouse wheel. Ooh, not that far. Squirrely mouse wheel. Let me reset. So this is the image out without any refinements, anything, right? So let's go and I want to apply a preset here, okay? Now I did say that the slide films are better for landscapes. So I'm going to stick with that. And this one, I want to go with gaff and then uh, this is an extra warm look, right? So we can see that now that I've selected this preset in the presets panel on the left, over on the right, it's labeled here. That layer is labeled. That's the look that we have applied to that layer. Really clear and concise. It's nice and easy. But let's say that we want to do more to this image than just this bright look. We can also, let's try something else. We can also, let's say, apply a color wash separately than our preset. I'm just going to select it here and drag it over and right where it says add layer, let it go. Now we can see that we have this orange color wash that happens on the left of the image and over on the right, it is more blue. We can turn that effect off and on just like this in the, pre in the layers panel. Now I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because layers do add a lot of functionality to the way that you can edit images and exposure. I did want to say, I did want to make this point though, that the presets can be just a starting point for the way that you make creative edits and exposure. A lot of the time, it does help to get moving along a way to find a look that you like, and then you can dial things in. 
and make it as custom as you want really easily. So I'm going to go back to dialing in the look to make it as custom as you want because we're talking about creative editing. So I'm going to undo this layer right here so that we're not confusing ourselves with layers yet. And now we're just back to we applied our film look that is from the slide film category of color films, GAF 500. Okay, so mentioned presets, take a look through there. You can search for them by name. Let's say if you want something that I was going to put portrait in, but if I start to type something in, you can see that it starts to, excuse me, list those out. If you want something that has a specific color in it, you can put that there or whatever. You start typing in and it'll find it. There are a whole bunch of presets inside of Exposure, over 500 looks here. So uh, you can, there's a, there's a lot of, of possibilities here in this panel. I'm going to close that because we have our applied look here. And then let's talk about how we can use our different uh, editing panels to do some stuff to this shot. Okay. So we talked about the crop tool, about rotating and strength, uh, straightening our image and all of that already. So I'm going to not talk about that again. I'm going to instead talk about how we have a brush tool and a, and a spot heel tool. And so I need to find an image that I need to use that. Here's a portrait with, yeah. Okay. So spot heel tool. Here's a good example. We can use it right here. Looks like the band-aid icon right at the bottom of the layers panel almost. We click that and you can see that the brush here on the bottom says heel. And then what that's going to do, obviously, is blend whatever it is that we don't want to see in the image away. And all I did was click once. We can see that this is the active spot here on the top. That means I can make adjustments to what I just did after I make the brush mark there to remove whatever it is. And uh, then I can adjust that in however I'd like. It's really easy to use. We can move the place that it samples from easily enough. It usually does a good job grabbing that place though. You don't have to mess with it. There's also a clone mode to the brush. And clone mode is better if, uh, if there's an issue, let's say on an edge, a hard edge like this, where um, let's find an image that might have something. Ah, here. Clone mode would be better for things like this, where maybe there's someone standing, right? Now, it's going to take more than just one swipe of the clone tool, but we can begin to take a look at what we want and how we want it to uh, disappear as soon as we see where the, oh, it went up top. Yeah, see how that jumped way up there? No, I want it to be on the wall. Bam. So we can see how the clone mode, this is how I would begin this process of finding an appropriate uh, place to duplicate and clone from, and then filling in more and more as I go with the clone tool, right? It's a little, it's actually quite a bit different than using the spot heel tool, but yeah. And we do have videos on the website that show how to use both of those tools. Just letting you know. So now let's talk about some basic and some color edits that we can make for our images. Let's find an image where we want to do some stuff like that. Here we go. Okay. So on the basic panel, this is a good place to begin when you're making creative edits. This is the basic panel. Uh, Exposure has automatic adjustments that you can tune to your liking in the following menu. You make how strong that you want them to apply. They apply intelligent adjustments to your images. And so you can see I hit the auto button and it did a couple of little tweaks to bring in the contrast here in this lower section, which I think looks good. So again, when you're making tweaks to your images, start at the top of the panel and work your way down through that list. So a good example is exposure which controls a lot, if not, yeah. Exposure controls all of the tones in the image, whereas highlights only control the highlights. Whites control even less of those tones, just the whitest ones. And same thing with shadows and blacks. Exposure is all of the tones. Shadows are just the dark tones, and blacks is just the darkest of the dark tones. So 
Start at the top, work your way down through the list. You can use your mouse wheel to adjust the size of the spot heel brush when you're using brush tools in exposure. That's the mouse wheel. That's the size. If I hold down shift, I didn't mention this before, guys, but I mentioned if I hold down shift, that adjusts the feathering edge. And if I hold down alt, that was size again, which was option. <laughs> that's what I was looking for. Hold down command or control on windows. That's the opacity. You can see how it goes up and down. Sorry, I meant to mention all of those keyboard shortcuts. There's a bunch. That's why we have that list. Okay, so now let's, we, we talked about making some edits to hues and tones in the image. Let's go further into that. And we'll talk about the color panel. Color is or are lots of the tones in the image. And you have a lot of ways that you can make adjustments here in the color panel and exposure. Now we can do simple things at the top of the panel, like add a color filter over the end of the lens. Uh, people did that with glass and plastic lenses. Uh, a lot of the times those things are used in black and white film photography, but you can use them here in color as well to give a little tone to the image. Uh, you can also just use a real quick warm or cool slider to add a little little edge of a tone there and you can also turn the density of that tone up to make it stronger okay and i turned it back off because i don't think we really need it for this image now down at the bottom i want to point out that we have a lot of controls for different colors in exposure so there's a couple of different views here there's i can uh i can grab a hold of the hue which is the color or the tones in and make adjustments or I can grab a hold of color saturation to make adjustments or luminance, which is the brightness of the middle of that color tone. And so in an image like this, I have a nice variant or gradient between a blue at the top to a very white blue in the sky at the bottom. And there's a little blue on this bottom section too, but I don't have a ton of very deep blue. So probably in an image like this, I can grab saturation and drag the blues up without ri risking having any block up okay or any areas where it's just all the way saturated which if i print that or if you look at it on online or whatever that'll that won't look that great so we can make adjustments to it just like this to do things like that we also have that uh orangey peach tone down here which i can't really put my finger on and so instead of dialing one thing at a time i'll grab the color picker tool and then just say this area I want to make more saturated and then drag up and you can see the reds and oranges sliders are being manipulated there that is way too much so I'm going to turn that down but we can see how it works okay so there's a couple of tools here we, we can also just uh, manipulate let's say the luminance or, or I mean the saturation of the shadows or midtones or highlights on their own Let's find a cool looking image. So sometimes portraits, here's a cool trick. Sometimes portraits, if you want to make it have a little bit more of a vintage feel, you can take the midtones and bring those down just a little bit. And then just in doing something like that, it adds this kind of a vintage feel to images, especially portraits. So something like that and uh, one of those portrait presets that I mentioned before, low contrast ones like Kodak Portra. That solid. See, I'm going to have to do it again, but yeah, super cool. Anyway, good trick. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the tone curve panel. We've talked about some of the controls we can make with color here. Tone curve does deal with color as well and tone. Uh, if you are used to using a curve editor in other software, you'll feel right at home here because Shazam, here's one right here. If you are not comfortable using the curve editor, don't worry, you don't have to touch it. Uh, <laughs> the curve editor is very sensitive. You can make a lot of changes and they'll make a drastic changes to your image. And so uh, a lot of the time people shy away from using it because it is kind of tough to handle. But you don't have to. You can use the sliders down below here in exposure to uh, you know, make some changes to the shadows. And then you can see on the curve editor what that change looks like in the curve. This is like kind of fine tuning that. And so there's also presets that you can select from here on the top of the panel, where each one of those, each one of the panels in exposure usually has a drop down of some sort. 
And that means that there's a preset here where you can do things that we've found people like to do over and over or something at least in the direction of something that they like to do. And so, uh, so here we can do uh, milky blacks, which you can see here raises the black point, meaning that the blacks themselves do not go all the way till black. And then we have an extra um, point right here, which brings down the contrast there in the darks just a tiny little bit. And so we can leave that the way that it is and move on. Let's do that. So let's uh, look at split toning down here. Split toning is a way of um, applying color to areas of the image based on its um, tone or uh, brightness or darkness value. So it's usually black and white images where you see stuff like this, where they apply a tone that's to the warm and the cool areas differently. Uh, but there's some color variations as well. And so we can apply something like this. And what this shows is that there's this blue tone. That's the color that is on the dark areas. You can see it's in the dark section here in the slider or in the bar and on that area of the image. So let's make it even darker areas in the image. And then it's playing or it's also placing a creamy yellow tone at varying strength raise that down, to the whiter areas. So I'm going to raise that up a little bit so that it's on the white, white areas right here on her dress. You can see it now. And uh, in like the white of her eyes and stuff like that. I don't really want it to touch her skin because I want it to look kind of old fashioned. Anyway, so that's the way we can do that. That's split toning. And that is on the tone curve panel. So now we've talked about how we can make some basic adjustments, follow in to tweak the tones uh, of color and even the bright and dark areas and relationships in the image. So let's move on and talk about some more creative stuff that we can do. And that would be to add stuff like vignettes. So this vignette here, I don't have a vignette on this image, but it's a great way to draw attention to your subject. And so, uh, like I said, there's drop downs on just about every one of the pre or, uh, panels and exposure. So we can go through different presets that we have already made up. Uh, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of variety here where you can see uh, what those different possibilities can do, and what they can look like on your photo. Uh, let's do um, something that we could learn from. So these have up on the top, say they have lumps. Let's give you a demonstration of what that lump means. So I chose a preset that has a nice hard edge to it. So you can see what's going on. I'm going to raise the distortion, which actually makes that image or what makes that vignette shape distort i would call wobber jawed but that's cool and colloquial anyway so we can change the lump size of how that is being changed or manipulated with the slider on the bottom and how much it's distorted by those lumps with the one on the top so now we have a nice strange analog look that we could change and move to a different position if we wanted to on the photo and, uh, and then we can make our other adjustments and then soften it back up. So we have a nice, uh, so we have a nice um, analog feel. You can see how it works its way around. This image is not round anymore, but in doing so, it gives it a nice handmade appearance. Quick little tidbit about making organic looking vignettes and exposures. Really easy to do. All right. So um, let's talk about another way that we can grab attention or focus attention to this subject is using the bokeh panel, which is right here. Bokeh is actually the Japanese word that talks about the quality of the out of focus areas of the image. So anyway, what I'm doing here is controlling, this is called the um, focus region. And what this is telling exposure is where I want it to be in focus is in the middle and where I want it to be out of focus is out here on this dotted line. So I want the out of focus to just be out here on the edges of her dress. And I also want it to kind of just be on this edge of this glass over here and there. So now let's apply some blur and we can see how that edge starts to come out, right? So we can see the blurring effect at full tilt now, which is way too strong. But when it's very subtle, that kind of effect is a very good way of drawing attention to the subject, especially the eyes and the face, right? So you can see when I have that panel open that I have the tools to manipulate the focus region in the preview. 
the big image in the middle. And if I close it, those tools go away, but the bokeh effect, the blurring is still there. Lots of power in the bokeh panel. You should definitely check that out if you haven't before. Speaking of power, let's check out grain. Now, I do have a, a preset applied here. We can see Kodak Portra. And Kodak Portrait does have a grain profile. So let's zoom in to check that out. So when I'm looking at grain, I'd zoom into one-to-one. -one. You can see over here on the left, it says one-to-one -one blue. Now I'm looking at white as white can be. I'm looking at mid-tones down here. I actually do prefer to look at skin when I'm looking at grain because I don't want skin to look textured. You don't want to add texture to skin unless I'm meaning for it to be, you know, a dark, crunchy black and white. I don't want grain to like make the skin look like it's rough. And so I will make sure that I have skin. So I'm looking at the grain here. I'll close this panel. I'm looking at the grain here as it comes across the image. In exposure, we can use presets just like we can on every one of the other um, panels. So I'm going to apply a preset so we can actually see what we're doing. I'm going to apply something that's very strong. Regular grain at 100%. Now I want to show that we can change where our grain is actually applying to the image very easily with the amount sliders. Uh, I, like I said, I don't want it to touch on the skin, so I'm going to bring it down in the midtones, and we can see how it automatically is finally not there, and it doesn't look like the noisy mess that it was before. Also, in the shadows here, we can see there's a lot of noise, or there's a lot of grain in those shadows, which it looks like noise. There was so much of it there. Now I have it in the highlights. I have it a little bit in the midtones, and I have it very, very little bit in the shadows. And even though it's at 100%, it still looks pretty good on this portrait. So if we turn it down a little bit more, I think it'll look more like a natural film. Now, there are a whole bunch of other options that we didn't touch on in the grain panel, such as adding roughness to the grain to make it appear more rough to appear have the contrast in that look more uh, rough or varied you can also vary the color if you want to put have color variation inside of your grain if you're not working in black and white and push processing actually adds uh, contrast to the image and increases that grain too that's a uh, darkroom trick push processing you can also um, change the size of the film to or the size of the film grain so that uh, instead of being large like it is in this image, you can make it even smaller by using larger size film. So uh, if you're going to print out your image large and it's a portrait, I would say go with something like viewfinder film four by five. It's going to have smaller film grains or clusters, which are going to look like a finer quality of film was used to shoot it. Now, if you're doing something like a moody, portrait in the street, I would definitely go with 24 by 36 film or 135, just a standard format 35 millimeter film, because it's going to have that lot, nice large grain that you would expect to see in that type of environment. So you can dial in the grain to, uh, to fit your image however you want. And just like with any other aspect of when you're working in exposure, you can also save your own presets for the way that you like how these things behave. So you can make your own grain or you can make your own uh, bokeh effect or you can make your own, um, well, really anything inside of exposure. So we're almost there. Let's talk about a couple of, one more quick thing here and that would be overlays. We do have overlays inside of exposure that add creative elements when they're needed. Things like borders that go around the outside of the image. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of different options of the borders themselves. So you can look through the different options and varieties. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a ton of different looks here. Uh, anywhere from painted edges um, or uh, the peel apart. What is that? Uh, Polaroid peel aparts. What are those? These are print edges, painted edges, tons of stuff. Anyway, tons of great stuff. Uh, make your images look a little bit more vintage, add a vintage feel to them, definitely. Uh, you can also add things like light effects and textures to bring additional um, creative elements in to your images. And there's a whole bunch of different ones here. So I'm not saying that I use these in every single shot, but you know, if it does, if the shot does need a little bit of interest, then there are a ton of options for how you can manipulate uh, these different uh, overlays to make them 
appear how would you would like to, including make them uh, dark and light and uh, do different things to your images. So definitely can add some very cool creative effects to your photos using this type of thing. And so that in overlays is very important to point out. Uh, oops. I also wanted to point out that after we have like a look applied, like we have right here in the overlays panel, you can see I set the opacity of this, I'll make it a little bit stronger so you can see it. Uh, I'm gonna close that, okay? Now, everything that we've done to this image so far, I'm gonna hold it down the backslash key, you can see the before. That's what it looked like when we first got the shot. And this is our look now, okay? So all of those controls that we have are right here within a single layer, okay? That layer has an opacity control, which means all of the edits we made, we can now dial the opacity of all of them together back a little bit. So let's say that our look is just a little too strong. So we'll dial it back just like that. So now if I turn the layer on and off, we'll see the before image and the after. So you can see that we still do have some effects here on this layer. There's something else I wanna point out. When we change the opacity, we can see that this glowing mask is what this is called. The layer mask is no longer white. It is gray. The brighter that mask is, the more of the effects on the layer you see. The darker it is, the less of the effects on the layer you see. Now, all of the effects are all of the adjustments that we made on all of these different panels. And you can see when I select on this layer, if I hover my cursor, you could see all of the controls that we made adjustments to are listed here. Also, you can notice on the layers or on the panels themselves, these little uh, reset symbols that are in circles. That means that those panels have made, you've made adjustments to those panels on this layer, okay? So, hey, guess what? We're talking about layers. So inside of layers, like I said, adds a ton of more functionality because we can do things like add edits that will be applied locally or just to one area in the photo. So a good, a really good clean example of something like that would be that we want to make a layer, uh, a dodge layer. So it makes things a little bit brighter. So what I've done is on my layer, I've moved my exposure up. That's it. Now I'm going to go to the layer mask. And then exposure will give me a whole bunch of different things that I could do to tell exposure where I want the effects on that layer to apply to this image. So what I'm gonna do is just use the brush. You see right here. And you can see that I have size, feather, and flow. I'm turn the flow up a little bit more because it's a little quicker. And I'm going to apply that just to her face and hair. Now we can, I mean, it's obvious. I'm, I'm making sure that my edits are very obvious to you, but I did paint a little bit in there. So now I have a mask. So if we look at the layer mask, we can see that there's black with a white smudge. If I hover my cursor over it, it shows me a highlight in the preview area where it's red. And that's where my mask is selecting, okay? Simple as that. So now I have a layer mask that's controlling the effects that I have on the layer. So you can see I can make adjustments to the effects on the layer if I wanted to. I can give it a little bit more contrast maybe, and maybe even add a little bit of clarity to make her eyes pop a little bit. Something like that would be fine. And I still have the control to turn the opacity of those adjustments down a little bit to make them blend in with the rest of the shot. So if I hold down the backslash key now and let it go. Now we have that effect applied as well. And it hasn't over sharpened or over uh, added more contrast or clarity to the face or anything or the rest of the shot, making our eyes lead back to details behind her. That's not what we want. So that is really where layers come in. There's a lot of things that you can do with layers inside of exposure. And all of them come down to the way that you can control where your edits are applied to different images. Now, let's talk about a couple of other quick ways that we can make edits in exposure and apply edits in exposure. Since we were, oh, oh, there we go. Since we were on the subject of layers and masks, let's talk about a couple of quick ways that we can apply them. We can do things like gradients. Remember before we had that orange color wash? 
and oh, I need to do it in here. Just let, let me make an adjustment here. Yeah. Okay, so now we have a very darkened layer, right? Uh, but we can see that we can control that using a gradient like this for a smooth natural fade if we wanted to, right? And there's, uh, there's other options for doing smooth natural fades at the edges of masks in exposure. I'm gonna delete that one. Now let's go back. We can use the brush like we did before and paint where we want it to be in exposure, just like that. Okay. I'm gonna undo that as well. Another thing that we can do is create a selection. And so using a number of awesome selection tools, we can tell exposure we want it to select a certain area of the image very quickly and pretty precise. And um, then we can even make adjustments, you know, if we needed to, to make sure that that's all nice and tight so that we have everything selected the way that we want. And then we see that our effects on this layer are only applied to the house. So there's a bunch of different options for creating selections for your layer masks and exposure to apply your different edits. And we have a bunch of videos that talk about the different options that you have for doing that type of work. So the last thing that I'm gonna point out is the history panel. The history panel is important because it kind of brings us back around to the beginning. Everything that we've done to all of the images inside of this folder have been saved. And you can see in the history panel, I can back my way up through all of those and go back to the beginning. Now, if there was more things that I did to this image, you'd see a lot more listed here in the history panel, okay? Now I can go back through, this, this enables me to go back through and make tweaks to my edits if I wanted to. Uh, it enables me to revisit edits that I made in the past. Let's say if I had, uh, if I had um, you know, done this shoot a year ago and I went back and looked at it and I was like, oh, I really like what I did here. I can go to the history panel and I can look through all those steps. So the history panel is really important. The reason I'm bringing the history panel up, because that segues into, remember at the beginning when we were talking about how exposure does its catalog, it's saved here in the sidecar. Now, all of the stuff that we did with all of these images is still saved and our, our is whatever, is our PM as our was where, anyway, all of the stuff was saved <laughs> inside of this folder in these sidecar files. So if I was working with an outside retoucher and I wanted to do some edits or I wanted them to do some things for me, if I have Dropbox or iCloud and we have a folder they do and I do that's synchronized on that service, all I need to do is drag the entire folder with all the images and all the edits right into that share. And that's all I need to do. And no, I didn't, I didn't want to move that. <laughs> now I need to put it back. Okay. So anyway, uh, so that's all I need to do is just drag and drop that. And it's that easy. And then they have, and I have access and we can see each other's edits as they're applied to those images in exposure. Okay, so that's a way that you can collaborate with outside retouchers and things like that. So there's one last step that's inside of exposure and that's to get the, the images that we've edited out of exposure because none of the edits that we've applied to these images has been applied to any of these images. They are completely safe. Exposure doesn't touch them. All of the edits are done within the sidecar file. So we need to export them. That would be to get them out. So I'm gonna select them and then hit uh, command E for export. And this may be very similar to what we saw in the beginning where we have destination. We have file naming options. We have settings options for the files that we export, you know, whether you want it to be a JPEG or a TIFF or whatnot, and quality options for those files. You can put output sharpening, right? You can assign metadata and watermarks if you set those up. And you can resize the image to however large you would like it to be, all within this export to folder dialog. Now you can see that it's going to export to the desktop folders, photos, webinar folder, which is fine. That's where it's gonna export. However, I have 30 images selected here, but I wanna export a couple of different options. So what I'll do is use the quick export, which you can see across, looking across there, reading across these laterally that, uh, 
I'm using, I'm looking at different recipes for exporting images. So essentially it is a folder location, how to name the file, how to, what file settings to apply, what metadata, and then how, how to size that image. Now I can select as many of these as I have set up and that I need to for all the images I have selected. So I have these three, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and they're all saved within different folders with different sizes and different quality settings. And so the 30 images I have selected with all three of these recipes, it's going to export 90 images. So that'll be each one of the images will be exported at these following or at these different, um, at different sizes or different uses. Okay. So that's a really quick way to get your images out of exposure to use quick export profiles. Anyway, with all of that said, that concludes our demonstration. So before we turn our attention over to answering any questions you have, I'll leave you with a couple of things. And that is that if you'd like to get in contact with us and other exposure users, we encourage you to do that in our Facebook group, the Exposure Users Group over on Facebook. It's right here, Exposure User Group. Another place to get in contact with us is on the gram. Hopefully it works. I got an error earlier today when I went to Instagram. So anyway, Instagram, like I said, isn't working right now. But you can use the hashtag MyExposureEdit on Instagram. And Instagram will, uh, and actually we monitor that hashtag. So that's a great way to get a hold of us to show us what you've made, what you've uploaded, you know, make using our software. We love to see that stuff. So uh, please contact us over there and uh, show us what you got. So with all of that said, I do believe that we are kind of at the end of our demo. So uh, if you have any questions or th something that you uh, didn't see answered today, go ahead and pipe up and we will make sure to handle it.